Um, and the world's number one English fluency guide. It is a pleasure to welcome you to another live video here on YouTube. And today we're going to talk about how to sound more natural and more native. So how to, uh, instead of using only textbook English, the kinds of things you would learn in a lesson that you can actually start using more native things, the things that natives really use in conversations. Uh, so as I get people in here, hopefully uh, I think YouTube should be telling people about this now. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll, let's see, I'll just put a note about this up here uh, for particular situations. Let me see here. So if you have a particular situation, something that you have trouble speaking about uh, or you'd like to know a better way to express something, let me know what your textbook English is and I'll give you a better way to say that. I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment, uh, but just letting people know, hopefully, yeah, it should be coming in uh, correctly. I think people are hearing me well too. Let me know if my sound uh, is up enough. Uh, but this, this idea came from, I just asked people on Facebook if they had any questions about learning or specific things they, uh, they were worried about that are preventing them from speaking. Uh, and Denise, one of our students said, hey, uh, can you talk more about how to use native natural expressions? So I'll talk about how to learn those as well. Uh, but as we're just getting in here, hopefully the chat is working. Uh, post and comment, let me see if I can post something. I don't know if chat is, okay. I think it should be working, we'll see. Uh, but the basic idea is that there's, there's nothing wrong with using textbook English. Uh, and this is just basically the kinds of things you would learn in a regular English classroom. Uh, but one of the main difficulties is that even if you only use that, those kinds of expressions, you will still hear uh, lots of different things from natives. No, of course we get a fire truck coming like usual when we go in, <laughs> when we have these live videos. Uh, so one thing I will talk about in this video is with your help, specific things that you have trouble saying. So if there are situations uh, when you are maybe having trouble expressing yourself or you'd like a better way of saying something, just let me know what that is. So you can give me some particular word or expression and I'll give you some better ways of saying that. I think this is easier than me just giving you a bunch of expressions. But you tell me. Uh, anyway, I will start this video with a very quick story. I was in my kitchen uh, pouring some milk into a glass. Uh, and my uh, older daughter, Aria, was there, so I'm just pouring a regular carton of milk into a glass, and there was only a little bit left. So I just was able to pour. I had, you know, a glass of milk right here. Here's my carton of milk. Uh, that's, that's not a very good carton of <laughs> Not a very good carton of milk, but I'm pouring the milk in there, and I only get maybe that much milk in the, in the bottom of the glass. And as soon as I do that, I'm pouring there, and I look, uh, and Aria says, game over. <laughs> so my older daughter, Aria, instead of saying something like, oh, the milk is finished or something like that, she used a very native, natural expression, just a different way of expressing this, which is game over. And so she, is, she has learned this from me when I'm uh, doing something and, and she understands that in this kind of situation we can use an expression like game over. So if you are playing a video game or you're playing a, like a board game or something like that this has just I mean you would even call this textbook English for that situation. So the interesting thing again about native speech is that we, we might take something that's simple but use it in a different situation and that's where it really sounds native and natural. Hopefully that makes sense. So we would take a, a phrase like a game over, if you're just playing a game or something and you would hear an expression like uh, game over, when the game is finished, we can also use this in other situations, all right? Uh, another thing I will uh, give, just a, a very common expression that I hear people using, uh, and this is also a very common situation in, uh, in conversations. I, I actually teach this in Fluent for Life, uh, but it's one of many thousands, expressions, thousands of expressions that we teach in the program, uh, but I thought it would be helpful to share it with everyone here as well. 
And so in this situation, you have usually two people talking uh, or a group of people that could be talking. Uh, so one person says something, we'll just say person A uh, is talking, and then maybe person B interrupts person A. So A is saying something, then B says something, uh, and then B usually says like, oh, I'm sorry, uh, like sorry for interrupting you. And then A says, uh, oh, I was going to say. So this is a, a, a common expression that you will see people using in real situations in real life, and you will hear this often. Uh, and it just means it's, it's something people say before they get back to the thing that they were uh, interrupted about or whatever. So person A is talking, they're saying something, and then maybe they get interrupted by B. And then when A gets to talk again, they say, oh, I, I, I was going to say this. Or uh, I was, I was just going to say this. Or you will hear I was gonna say this. So instead of going to, uh, I was gonna say this, or I was just gonna say this, uh, I was just gonna say, and you will hear it faster like this, I was just gonna say, I was just gonna say. Uh, but this is a, a very simple way, instead of uh, like thinking about, I don't know, like a textbook way of expressing this, it's easier just to, to know some certain uh, phrases like this you can use, and then you can just, uh, after you've heard natives use these a lot, it will feel very natural for you to use them as well. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to give two quick examples about this. So one is game over and the other is I was just going to say, but it will be helpful for me uh, if you tell me specific phrases where maybe you, you usually say this uh, or if you have heard a phrase that a native used and you didn't quite understand why they said that. So I'd like to do this. Uh, I think it will be helpful for you, uh, especially this is the kind of time where I can give in a native uh, or in a live lesson where I can help people with specific questions they have about their particular situations. All right, Vincent, nice to see you there from Sao Paulo, Brazil. And uh, Ming Shu says, your old daughter means you have another daughter. Yes, that's correct. So I would say my older daughter, my older daughter. So I have two daughters and good, good thinking though, but yes, this is exactly what, what you get from kind of paying attention like a native rather than trying to think about it like a student. Uh, but the basic idea, if I have like, you know, let's say I only have one daughter uh, and so this is my daughter. And if I have two daughters, then I have an older, so older, older daughter, and then the opposite would be what? So if this is my older daughter, then who would this one be? Let me know in the comments. I want to make this easy, but you should be thinking like a native. This is how I speak with my own kids when I'm teaching them things. I have them try to guess something, and when they're right, obviously they feel very excited about that. So this is my older daughter, older daughter, then who is this one? Yep, very good. Younger. Now I know this may seem like a, like a simple thing or a silly thing to ask because the answer might be obvious, but you would be surprised and, and often uh, we want to really, I really want to help you be thinking more like a native as you learn. So rather than a teacher trying to tell you something, you should be looking for patterns and thinking like, oh, okay, so we got the older and now we have the younger one as well. Now imagine I have three children Let's say I have three daughters. What would I call them then? How would a native speaker describe these? So as usual, there are more than one way, uh, or there are many ways usually to exp exp uh, express certain things, but this is a very simple one. So if we have three daughters or more, the oldest. So this is my oldest daughter, and we have the youngest, E-S-T, -E my youngest daughter. And what do you think that one is? I'll give you a moment to see if you can figure that out. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, yes, for my actual daughters, I only have two. So I have an older daughter and a younger daughter. My older daughter, Aria, is uh, seven years old. And my younger daughter, Noelle, 
is, uh, or the younger daughter, Noel, is uh, four years old. Uh, let's see, again, Shim uh, Par says, uh, hi, Drew, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. You're looking outstanding, fantastic. Good to be outstanding. I feel, I feel great. Here we go. Where are you from, sir? I'm from Chicago, but I live in uh, Nagasaki, Japan. Uh, so you introduced your older daughter when she was born, but there is no introduction of the younger baby. Yeah, it was, you know, this is an interesting thing about, <laughs> about like parenthood. Uh, I remember seeing this, I'll, I'll answer this question first to see if anybody got that. Yes, very good. Middle. So if we have uh, like my oldest, my middle, and my youngest daughter. All right. So yes, about, about like maybe this is something more people can uh, relate to. But I remember seeing a, a like a really funny picture, just uh, just like a meme on the internet. It showed like uh, pictures of of two babies. So this is there's like the first child, the first child. There it was like a beautiful baby picture, and there were like beautiful flowers all around. And it was it was like a very expensive photo. It looked really nice. Uh, and then there was a picture of the second child, which is like it was just you know a regular baby picture with just one one little flower. <laughs> so like people people don't care as much about the about the second child. That's a the, the basic idea. Uh, I, of course, I care about both of my children. But the reason I didn't I didn't bother making another video with Noel is because it would have just been the same thing as the one with Aria. Uh, but they are, in fact, two very different kids, and uh, maybe I will bring both of them in for uh, maybe a video, something like that. Uh, but if, that, if that's uh, entertaining for you, but mo most of the things that I do at home are the same things I do like this. So I'm looking for situations where I can help them understand something like a native and then teach them phrases and really help them, again, thinking more about patterns of speech rather than trying to teach them rules or grammar or things like that. Uh, but yes, anyway, I thought that was very funny. Uh, but these are the kinds of things when you're trying to learn patterns, this, was, this is how you should be thinking. So I'm trying to teach my uh, kids in the same way. All right, now as we go through these, if you have specific questions about, about phrases you would like to know, let me know, and then I'll, I'll, I'll cover those and give you some more examples of those. All right, <clears throat> so let's see, Moosing, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, how can we speak like native speakers? All right, so this is another thing we can talk about in, in the video, even though Really, the point of this video is just talking about uh, specific vocabulary you can use to sound a bit more native. Um, but the basic idea is that there is what we'll call English as a second language lessons, and then we have English as a first language lessons. And English as a second language lessons usually begin with uh, your native language. So they don't begin with English, they begin with your native language. And they usually begin uh, with a textbook. So we have a textbook here, we've got some pictures of things, uh, and it's in your native language. So let's just, I'll just use Japanese uh, for example, because uh, I, can, I can draw that flag <laughs> easily. So we'll draw a, uh, here's a picture of the Japanese flag, <clears throat> and then we're going to move that uh, going to English. We'll just use America as an example. <clears throat> All right, so that's my American flag up here. And so part of the, the difficulty for people learning is that they're going from their native language into English. And so when we're talking about textbook English, like we're talking about here, uh, then we will have an expression here, like we will learn uh, like finished. So finish or finished, the, uh, the past tense, uh, you would learn a word like that and then you would translate from Japanese into English. So you would begin with the Japanese word, translate it into English, and then anytime you need to say finished, you would use that. But the problem, again, is that natives will use many different expressions rather than uh, beginning with like a, a Japanese word uh, for Japanese learners. So uh, as an example, we've got the word finished over here. 
if you if you look carefully, we're beginning with a word in, and I, I've written it in English, but you would finish it. Let's say we just say like "watta," which would be the the Japanese for like something is like something is finished, and that's one way of talking about this. Uh, but in English, we begin with a situation. I'll just put an S right here. So a situation for something, and then we look and pay attention for all the different ways someone might, uh, someone might say this. So as I, I gave the example earlier in this video about game over. So instead of just saying like, oh, look, something is done, something is finished, we could say, oh, game over. Now, another way, another more advanced uh, is another like kind of expression we could use to talk about this same thing of being finished. So we begin with an idea. We're not really beginning with, with a word. We're beginning with an idea, although often like, like you could just put finish in here for when something is ending. Uh, so like a relationship is ending, maybe like you see a boy and a girl they used to be dating and now, oh no, they split up. Ah, game over. Game over. So there's no game happening, but we use that same expression. But you wouldn't learn something like that if you're learning in the English as a second language way because you're just beginning with something like finished and you would say, oh, the relationship is finished. The relationship is finished or the milk is finished, or the class is finished, or like, you know, that, that boxer, he got like really badly beaten up, the boxer is finished. So you can use that, but it will be confusing for you when you start trying to go the opposite way of hearing all of these different expressions that natives actually use. So we've got finished, game over, we might also hear like that's all she wrote. That's all she wrote. There's another expression, a longer expression you will hear for the same situation. So that's the end, game over, finished. That's all she wrote. So that's like the end of the story. So we, she didn't write any more than that, like the author didn't finish any more, write any more of the story. That's all she wrote. That's all she wrote. So all of these different expressions are the native ways of describing this. We, of course, also use the word finish, but Often we want to you know, describe things in a slightly more interesting or natural way, and so we will use something like that. It's a little bit maybe boring. You know, People are writing books or telling stories, and they want to make it sound a bit more interesting. So game over. If you've ever, ever seen uh, the, uh, the movie Aliens, uh, so this is where some uh, like space soldiers go to a planet and try to kill some, some aliens. There's a, a scene where, where one of the, the soldiers, after, after their plane blows up, he says, Game over, man! Game over! And this is like a really famous line from that movie, but he's, again, he's just saying, we're finished. <laughs> like, that's the end. Something is, there's a, a really big problem, and you can understand that from the situation. So you can see him really excited. Game over, man! Game over! The same thing. Or that's all she wrote. All right. Hopefully this is making sense. But the point is with English as a first language, we're, we're beginning with a situation and then looking at how natives would respond to that. So what are the kinds of things a native might say in that situation? We don't begin with just a word in a different language and then try to translate that. Uh, and I should probably just write this in Japanese over here. But the basic idea, again, you're going from a Japanese word to the translation in English and you're trying to remember what those are. Uh, rather than trying to learn English as a first language where you're beginning with situations. And remember, this is how children are learning their native language because they can't translate anything. So a child, like my daughter, my older daughter, Aria, she heard me say, game over, when we're talking about a game. But then she also heard me say, game over, when we're talking about something else being finished. Oh no, time is up, game over. So we have to go home, we can't play at the park anymore, I'm sorry game over. It's time to go back home. And so she learns that, ah, okay, I can use game over uh, in a different situation, even though it's talking about basically the same idea. All right, let me go back and see if I got some, uh, some more comments over here. Uh, that is an old farther way. 
That is an old farther way. You mean, hopefully, I don't know if you mean father or not. Daniel says, could you share a link about your online courses? Uh, actually, yes. Uh, if you click on the link in the description of this video, it will take you to Fluent for Life. Uh, you can find the link for Frederick below this video as well. Uh, yesterday I saw a video of Stephen crashing about language actions. This is, this is the same technique you use. Both are awesome people. Go get it. Yes. So I actually sent uh, maybe two days ago uh, a link to watch that video. So this was uh, the, the video about Stephen Krashen talking about language acquisition. And he's, he's talking about the same thing I do. So what's, what was really interesting, uh, just to talk about Stephen Krashen for, I, I've probably mentioned him many times, uh, and you can actually learn more about him if you click on the link in the description. But basically, he and I both discovered the same thing in different ways. So Stephen Krashen is a linguist uh, and a language researcher, and he was basically trying to understand how fluency works. How does it happen? How does it develop? And over his own research, he found that we all get fluent in any language in the same way, and that is by understanding the language in the language. And he calls this comprehensible input. I call it just understandable messages. You can call it comprehend comprehensible input. Uh, but that's basically what, we, what, we're, what we're talking about right here. So learning English as a first language is not about trying to take your, you don't begin with your native language, you begin with a situation and then we're seeing how natives are talking about that. What are the patterns that they use when they talk about different things? So something finishes, something is over. Oh no, like right at the end of this video, ah, game over. That's all she wrote. I'm sorry, that's the end of the video, that's all she wrote, okay? And as you pay attention to these, you will start learning more and recognizing these things more. And this is how you go from learning things and only using textbook English to using the things that natives really use. Now remember, there's nothing bad about using the word finished or using the word no or using the word whatever. Like it, it's not, the, the bad thing isn't uh, like that you should not you know, learn this vocabulary because it's useful vocabulary and natives also are speaking with the same vocabulary. The difference is that there are many other things that most learners do not learn in school. So when you translate something, you're, you're really trying to make it as simple as possible in the ESL approach. So this is why you begin with a Japanese word like oaru. So let me just see here, I just, there. So we, we begin with something like oaru, so this means finish. And that's why in a Japanese English textbook, you will see a bunch of uh, English, or you will see a bunch of Japanese, even though it's an English textbook. And this is because we're just going to tell you what the definition is. Now, this is an interesting thing about learning as well. Uh, that's I, like, I don't, I don't think I've heard uh, Crash and mention this, um, but this is talking about the, the, like the mental side of how you feel when you discover something for yourself. So rather than a teacher telling you exactly what something means, the more you can discover that for yourself, the more excited you feel about learning. All right, and so it's, it's exactly like watching a movie. If you're watching some kind of scary movie or a thriller or something like that, uh, and I give you an example or like tell you what, what happens and say, oh, the killer is this person. You're going to be angry about that because you want the chance to solve that problem yourself. Or the same thing in a video game. If someone tells you how to solve something, you feel bad because you want the chance to solve that problem yourself. All right. So if you can do this in language learning, you will develop that skill much more easily. Uh, the tricky thing is that you've been trained for so many years just to wait for a teacher to tell you what something means rather than, okay, let me like pay attention closely to this situation and watch what natives are really saying. Okay. But this is how you do it. So instead of just trying to look at vocabulary in your native language and look at what uh, a basic word might be in English, you would take something like a situation and listen for the different ways that natives would describe that. All right, let's see if we got, oh, Antonio says, a big hug from Brazil, thank you very much. Hater is back, uh, is this similar to the way he presents more than one way, for example, so, uh, so 
say I am sorry or ways to say thank you and so on for the rest of the situation. Is this correct? Yes, that's it. So the basic idea is that in, in any situation, there are usually multiple ways to express yourself. And this is why uh, in, this, in, a, in like a regular textbook way, you will learn maybe one word for a particular situation. So you might learn a word like oaru in Japanese, and we learn that that means uh, to finish something. Uh, and then if we hear something different, like game over, it's like, wait a minute, oaru doesn't mean game over. Like that's a different Japanese expression, actually. Uh, and the same thing, like that's all she wrote. That would, that would, you would be kind of crazy to try to translate uh, one thing like that into this. Now this is a big problem for language translating software because it's trying to take all of these things and fit them back into these expressions. Uh, but Owaru does not mean the same thing as like that's all she wrote. Like, I don't know, if you were to translate that in Japanese, it would be much different than, than Finnish. So it'd be like, so like something something like a something she finished. But it wouldn't be like oaru. The point is it's not like a a one-to-one -one thing that you can easily translate. But a native can understand it very easily because they're not trying to translate the word, they're trying to look at the situation when people would use it. So the more examples you can get, like uh, if you're trying to say, I'm sorry, so it's, the situation is someone is apologizing to like, to say sorry. So you can think about the many different ways that a native might say that, and also, depending on how, uh, like how serious that might be. So let's say the situation is to say, I'm sorry. Hater gave that example. Uh, we might begin with, let's say this is uh, a range uh, from like serious uh, to not serious. And this, I just mean like, it's a big problem or not a big problem. So if you have to say, I'm sorry, uh, if it's just like a very small thing, like you accidentally hit someone in a, in a restaurant or something like that. So I'm walking and I maybe bump them a little bit. Uh, I, oh, I could just say, oh, sorry. Or I could say something like, my bad, which has become more kind of conversationally useful uh, in recent years, like many years, like a, a, maybe a, like a 70, 80 year old person would not say my bad. <laughs> it's more for... Uh, for younger people, but this is another thing you get as you pay attention to the language. You start noticing who is using the expressions. So you notice older people speak in a different way, or younger people speak in a different way. So everyone might use the word finish, but different people might express things in a different way. Uh, so you might go a little bit uh, maybe higher, like I'm very, I'm very sorry. Or you might have, allow me to apologize. Or, uh, oh, I'm terribly sorry about that. All right? <clears throat> but the point is, uh, as, you, as you're thinking more like a native, you're trying to integrate all of this information, and it becomes much easier uh, when you think about it from situations rather than trying to think about it from vocabulary and translate that. All right? Hopefully that makes sense. If you have more questions about that, let me know. All right. So 20 phrases to say it's over or 20 phrases to say I apologize. Yeah. And again, uh, I don't need to give like a whole bunch of those because you can find lots of those online. The point is more how you think about this and looking for, looking for situations like when you apologize. So if you're watching a movie and you see like one person kills somebody else, well, that would be very serious. Or one person, uh, you know, does something like they forgot, I don't know, something else. Like maybe you forget your, your wife's birthday. Maybe that's pretty serious. <laughs> uh, or, you know, something like that. But you will see, <clears throat> rather than trying to memorize a list of these things, the point is to pay attention for them. And so that, why, that way, uh, when you're looking for situations and how 
uh, people use these, you would begin with the situations that you have uh, in your life. So the things that you deal with most. So when I came to Japan uh, and I wanted to learn about uh, gardening, I was focused on that. So I was learning about gardening situations. How do we talk about moving a rock? Or how do we talk about putting some moss on the ground or something like that? Uh, but the basic idea, again, is you're looking at situations rather than looking at vocabulary. All right. Uh, Claudette says, greeting from Mexico. Always a pleasure to learn English from me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. All right, let's see. And uh, greetings from Germany. Good morning here in India. Thank you very much for your efforts. So if I learn in the usual way a translation into my mother tongue, how would I correct the words I learned? Uh, that were literally translated in my mind. Sometimes when you translate an expression, the expression in another language will maybe not make sense. From my bad in Portuguese doesn't make sense if you translate it. Yeah, uh, so good questions, Fabio. So the, the basic idea, again, like you have been trained for many years to learn in the English as a second language way. And this means you will, you will probably get things, you, you will probably even think in Spanish or Portuguese or whatever your native language is. Uh, so you will think in that language first and then think about what you want to say and mentally translate it. When what you should be doing is trying to, you're, you're, you're basically training your mind to think in a different way. So rather than beginning with your native language, you begin with the situation. And I would just like be, be mindful of this like I am. Uh, so in my house, let's say, I don't know, my kids are running around and my wife yells at them or something like that, as an example. Now, I will get this lots of like lots and lots of examples of Japanese for getting angry at kids. <laughs> so as a parent, this is something that's useful for me because I will hear these expressions and I can use these expressions if I want to. But if I am a, a teenager uh, or I'm a young adult and I don't have my own family, then this vocabulary is not really useful for me. So a lot of these things, again, they come from your particular life situation and then you look at the kinds of things that you hear. So if you like going out to restaurants, you should pay attention. So one thing like I would do if I go to a, a, a Japanese Japanese restaurant or something, uh, I would go to a restaurant and just sit down and listen to how other people are ordering food. So I order my food and I can listen. I'm, I'm paying attention to the other tables around me. I'm kind of listening to the conversations, things like that, and listening to how people order stuff. So it's, uh, it's a pretty simple thing, but the point is I'm focusing on a situation and getting lots of different examples. Now, I'm of course, like I might not use all of those things, but I will become very uh, aware of them and it will be easier for me to understand natives when they're in those situations. All right, so that's really the point of this, uh, is thinking about the situations people have rather than trying to begin with particular vocabulary. And so the, the basic idea is that you have to retrain your mind to focus on situations rather than focusing on spe specific words. And it's okay like to think about, ah, I'm, I'm thinking about like a good word for this or whatever, but ask yourself, what would a native say in this situation? And then it's easy to find that like, I mean, even uh, like watching videos on YouTube can give you basic examples of lots of different situations, like apologizing uh, or buying some food or something. So you can go to like watching a travel show when people are buying things or, or going to different, you know, ordering in restaurants or whatever. Uh, but I would look for real native content. That's why we put real native content into Fluent for Life. We want to have actual conversations between people so you can see how people are responding to each other, the ways that they interrupt or the ways that they might explain things. We're really trying to give you more situations for that uh, rather than just giving you some textbook examples of things that you can memorize, all right? So again, think about it from the situation perspective. The point is not to, uh, to, to try to, to think about things in your native language and then translate them, uh, even though this is the way you've been taught to learn languages. So you will have to, have to begin making that switch in your mind, just, just paying attention. It's actually quite easy to do once you start doing it. Uh, and you will feel really great when you discover something like, ah, like I, now I know what that means and you learned it like a native rather than learning it like a student. And you can really feel that switch in your mind. 
All right, uh, Victor says, when learning a language, not only learn or acquire the language, but also the culture or the way of thinking. Yeah, and so that's another thing, Victor, excellent point, uh, that we will also, and, and this, is a, this is like another thing about, um, uh, like learning, language learning, not just trying to learn the vocabulary, but also understanding where the vocabulary comes from. So learning these kinds of things, you can learn about the culture of apologizing or the culture of uh, ordering food or the culture of doing all kinds of things. So how do people explain, how do people move when they speak? You know, like people think about Italians or whatever talking with their hands a lot, and that's part of their culture, it's part of what they do. And so you learn those kinds of things as you pay attention to the living language. All right, the living language is the, is the point. The language changes and evolves and adapts over time. Uh, and this is another, I, I, uh, I heard or my staff told me about um, someone, someone had, had like written, written to us and said like my, my method doesn't work, um, but instead like the kind of ESL method was better uh, and, and they were just saying like, well, you have, uh, or they were explaining what they learn with, uh, and they have, um, I don't know, they were, I forget what, what sort of resource they were talking about, but it was like, like vocabulary and learning some pronunciation and learning some stuff like this from a website that didn't have lots of actual native examples in it. Um, and, and often the English as a second language approach will break down the language, so they will kind of split the language up into different parts like this. So you've got grammar, pronunciation, vocabulary, uh, but in the, the EFL approach, all of these things are integrated in one situation. So when you're learning to say, I'm sorry, you're learning pronunciation and grammar and vocabulary all at the same time, and you're learning how a native would actually say it. And so that's why I don't understand like th this, this approach of, of uh, it's okay to, to break down the language into different pieces uh, if you're beginning with real speech, which is what we do in Fluent for Life. So we try to give you uh, examples of the way natives would really communicate, and then we're going to show you that maybe in a little bit easier to understand way, because it is helpful to get some explanations uh, just to learn a little bit faster. But if you can discover more things by yourself, that's even better. Uh, but the point is like, if you're, if you're trying to learn, let's say pronunciation, and you only hear individual sounds, you can like push a button and listen to one sound, but you can't compare easily different sounds, then you're, you're going to struggle to, to improve your pronunciation and listening. Because hearing one sound, like one, one letter, is not as good as being able to compare a bunch of different letters together. This is why we built Frederick the way it is. Uh, you can also click on the link in the description to learn more about Frederick. Uh, but the basic idea is that, again, we want to integrate the language. We want to put all of these pieces together uh, rather than trying to learn them in separate, separate pieces. And I'm always, uh, it's always kind of uh, confusing to me when people write me and if they say, Drew, your method doesn't work. <laughs> I say, well, of course it works. It's how you got fluent in your native language. So it, it's not, I didn't, I, I have not created anything new. Uh, I'm, I'm not like developing any like fancy, I don't know what, like a technique or something like that. All I'm doing is really helping you learn English like a native speaker. That's it. Because, uh, Really, that's the only way you're going to be able to speak. Uh, let's see. All right, so let's see. Claudette said, there are so many phrasal verbs and there are so many meanings as well. What is your advice to learn them faster and stick to them forever? Any advice, please? Uh, well, you should, if you're not already a member of our visual guide to phrasal verbs, you should get that. Uh, but I'll give you the whole, my whole, like, actually, if people want to know how to do that, it's, you, you, can, you can do all the things that I'm doing um, like by like the same things I do, you can do them yourself. It's just a bit more difficult. Uh, but if you're curious, uh, I can explain. Actually, let me let me see if people would like to know that. If you'd like to if you'd like to know more about like like learning kind of how I do phrasal verbs, let me know in the in the comments here, and I'll speak more about that. Uh, but I'll, I'll move on because I've covered that before. But if you want to hear if if enough people want to hear more about that, then let me know. Um, all right, let's see. 
So Ming Shou, may I know your daily life in Japan? How much time uh, that you can speak English? Uh, actually, I don't like this is my English speaking time, really. <laughs> Most of my time, uh, if, I'm, if I'm speaking to people, uh, I'm speaking in Japanese. And unless I'm at home, I, at home I use almost all English because I want my kids to get uh, lots of English input. And I'm really the main source of that. They will watch some you know, TV shows or uh, YouTube videos or things like that uh, to, to, to learn some English. Uh, but I'm the main person in the house that uses English. Their mother also speaks uh, really good English, uh, but I, I want to like give them even more. And so since they have a lot less time uh, to learn those things, like so they spend most of their time going to regular school and, and it's all in Japanese. Uh, so I have to take time and be uh, very strategic about how I teach them because I don't have, I, I don't, they just don't get enough, uh, enough time for that. All right, uh, so Claudette, welcome to Real Life, says make a story containing your phrasal verbs. Yeah, that's part of it, yeah. Uh, your channel is pristine. Pristine, well, that's, that's an interesting way to put it, pristine, pristine, and usually pristine means like, it's kind of like a clean and untouched, like a pristine mountain. You know, like nobody goes there, there are no buildings on it, that kind of thing. Uh, but if you want to say, like, uh, it's helpful or a fan, like you're a fan of the videos, then yes, fantastic. You can, uh, you can describe it that way. Thank you very much. Claudette, again, have you ever thought about inviting some students to appear in your YouTube channel? I would love to see you with your students. Uh, you can actually find some videos where I have done that. And on our Instagram channel as well, I have invited... Uh, some people to join me in videos. I don't know if it's possible to have people um, join on these videos or not in YouTube, but I have done that on, uh, again, Instagram videos where I actually have me kind of doing individual one-on-one -on -one work with students. But usually what happens is like, it's the same advice I would give for most people. Uh, and so usually it's maybe some pronunciation or something like that. But when uh, people really feel that they need some kind of personal attention, uh, when it's not as important as most people think, it's usually just a lot of the same advice that I give generally to people uh, that, I'm, that I'm using for helping them. But if you'd like to see me speaking with learners, you can find that um, uh, on the channel. Just look for that on the channel. Sam says, hi, uh, we want to know every things. You mean like all things or everyday things? John says, hello. Adrian, is there something that I can do to remember the pronunciation of difficult words? I've been thinking about it because I live in a Spanish country with no contact uh, with English speakers at all. Yeah, uh, so for learning pronunciation, as I've talked before, there are basically two parts to this. The first one is learning the individual sounds of letters because there really are uh, some very simple rules that help you pronounce English. Uh, so these are called uh, the rules of phonics. So phonics just means the sounds of English. So as an example, we have a word like cat, but if we put an E on the end of this, this becomes Kate. And you can learn rules like this very simply. You can, uh, very simply, you can teach them yourself uh, these in Frederick. Let me put this up here. So if you want to learn how to pronounce, we take you from uh, words like cat to words like symphony and apocalypse and... Uh, I don't know, advantage or whatever. I forget exactly what higher level words we have, uh, but it takes you through over 2,000 words. And the, the really the deeper point of the program is to teach you how to think about pronunciation like a native. So natives are learning the pronunciation of individual words, and they're also learning how you blend words together. So you might have like this. I was, I was teaching this uh, actually to a, a woman like a week and a half ago, I think. Uh, so this, let's see, this star. So if we have uh, words like this star, so a native would pronounce this as this star, this star, this star. So this S basically disappears and these blend together. So it's like this star, this star. So the star, 
this star. So when you're learning uh, the sounds of individual words and you also learn how to blend them together, which is what we do in Frederick, uh, then you can learn how to pronounce basically anything. So this will teach you the spelling of words, how to say them, and how to hear them very clearly. Uh, click on the link in the description if you'd like to learn more about that. Uh, let's see, Rue Copes, it seems since I started to work on my pronunciation, my listening comprehension has increased significantly. Yeah, so the, these two skills are, are connected. So all, all of the skills are really connected, your listening, your grammar, your pronunciation, but the listening specifically is connected with uh, pronunciation. And what's interesting is that people think they need to like practice speaking to improve their pronunciation when actually the opposite is really true and and when you listen to enough english and if you hear 10 different people say something your your pronunciation will automatically improve even if you don't uh like repeat yourself a lot so you you don't have to say that and it's it's kind of like hitting a uh, hitting a note in music so if i give you if we have uh i don't, I don't even remember how to draw like a, a music stab, it's like something like that, I think, something, or maybe that's a dollar sign, or <laughs> I forget how to draw the, I think that's a treble, a treble clef, but uh, for this, like let's say I say, hey, I need you to like hum this note, I don't know what this is, uh, I forget how to read music, but let's just say it's ding, and if I just say ding, like you hear that by itself, you might not be able to hear it, but if you can start from a different note that you can make, so if you say like ding, ding, something like that, uh, we, can, we can try to get our sound down to where it should be. So I call this sound transitioning, uh, but it's a way of trying to make it easier to connect like ding, trying to get to that uh, particular sound you're going for. And this is why Frederick, again, gives you lots of chances to compare different sounds. So if you can hear a, e, e, a, uh, and you can really spend time listening to these different sounds and you can easily get your pronunciation and your listening uh, improved a lot. All right. Let's see. John says, I would like to have your secret for mastering phrasal verbs. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'll mention this very quickly. So this is a, it's actually a very simple process. And this is the way natives are, again, I'm teaching everything the way natives are learning. So the way this usually works, I do it in uh, three steps. See if you can imagine uh, what these are. But the basic idea for learning not only phrasal verbs, but for any, uh, any kind of vocabulary uh, is, number one, we want to try, if we can, to understand it visually. Uh, and so an example of this, if we're talking about phrasal verbs, uh, maybe you would learn, I don't know, I think I gave this example in, a, in another YouTube video before, but I'll, I'll give it again because many people are new on this video. So if we have a boat right here, and the boat down here is, we can look at the action. We imagine this marker is a boat, and oh no, uh, we can talk about this. The phrasal verb would be to go under. So the boat is physically going under the water. We mean like going under the, under the surface of the water. So we want to try as we can to understand something visually and almost every really example of phrasal verb that children are learning and phrasal verbs are really important because this is what we're using to make things a little bit more complicated for children. Uh, so they're learning a difference between like sit down and sit up. All right. So as an example, uh, again, we're learning in a visual way. If we have a chair like this, if we have a person Let's say we might have, I'll just compare this, I don't have a chair right in front of me, uh, but if we imagine three different things. We have a person standing, and then we have a person uh, sitting, and then we have a person, I don't know, like this last one, like maybe their, their posture is like really, really bad. They're sitting like this. So this one, we could, if, we, if we tell a child like stand up, so we don't want to just stand, but stand up. We want to get them that, that connection of stand with up, meaning we want you to stand well, stand erect, like stand up straight, stand up straight. And so if we have sit down, again, we have the action and we're talking about moving from standing to sitting, so sitting down. Uh, but then this one, we might have sit up. So sit up, if you think about stand up and sit down, then we get the idea of, so I'm kind of, 
you know, my back, my posture is, is not looking very good and my mom tells me to sit up. So, okay, now I'm going to actually sit up and, you know, usually teachers will tell kids to do that in the same way. So this is to sit up. But the basic idea here is that kids are learning these things visually. You can actually see what's happening. And so again, you're looking at the situation visually, what is happening and what are the words people are using for that situation. So in this situation, what do people say? You see like a child, okay, the teacher says stand up and the child stands up. Another child is watching that and they think, oh, okay, well, I guess stand up means to, to get in this position. And they're not trying to translate from German or Thai or whatever. They're just looking at the situation and making that connection. So it's much easier to do this when you're learning things uh, visually. All right. Uh, and next we want to begin like the, the kind of second thing here is we want to look at core meanings of, of phrasal verbs. Uh, so we'll just call this like core meaning. And the, I mean, these are like one and two are basically linked together. Uh, but the core meaning of something like uh, like a phrasal verb, where we're just just beginning with something that's uh, easier to understand. Again, with a visual meaning, and we're looking at like stand or sit. So the core meaning of that, what does that mean to stand? So it just means like you know something is up rather than being like sideways like that. So I can have a, like a pencil right here. I'll draw a little pencil. So this pencil is standing up rather than lying down, okay? So it's the same idea, like the pencil doesn't have legs, but it's vertically in a position like that. So it's standing up. Again, we have the visual example, and we're looking at the core meaning of stand. And so we get a couple of different examples of what that means. Uh, and as we see more of those, it makes more sense, uh, like trying to learn phrasal verbs that way. So another thing like take, so if I have a, a little bit more complex word like take, we have just an idea of like moving one thing from one place to something else. Now that could be like stealing it or it could be just bringing it with you, but you will see these in different visual examples as you're learning them and you understand the core meaning of take. All right, so we're transferring something from one place to something else. Maybe we're carrying it. Like I take a, a, a lunch to work with me. So I take my lunch. I bring it from my house to, uh, to work. Uh, and then after we're, we're understanding visually and we're getting the core meaning, then we can start learning more figurative uses of stuff. So we'll just say figure. So figurative uses. So we begin with an easy visual example, and then we move to the more figurative uses over here. So going back to the boat example, uh, we have go under. So the boat is sinking. We can take this same phrasal verb, which we have like a visual example of, and then we can get the more figurative, figurative uh, example of something like the company is going under, meaning bankruptcy. All right, so the company in the same way like the their, their money is getting worse and worse, they are losing money, or maybe they will have to close the business. So the business is going under. Does that make sense? So when we're learning uh, not just phrasal verbs, I do this with phrasal verbs because phrasal verbs are so common, they're important to learn. Uh, these are, this is really the core of uh, children going from just saying one word to making phrases. And this is why it's again really important for pronunciation and listening and grammar as well. Uh, and why I have a whole program that's dedicated just to this. Uh, so in Fluent for Life, of course, there are, I don't know how many, probably like, I don't know, hundreds of phrasal verbs that we teach, uh, but also the visual guide to phrasal verbs is included in that program. Uh, but this is, again, what I'm doing usually when I'm trying to explain something, uh, like some kind of expression or an idiom or anything like that. I really want to help you understand it. If I can't really show you visually, maybe I can tell you a story. Uh, somebody mentioned that, I think. Um, but the point is to, to help you understand it from a situation rather than trying to think about it as like, I want to translate that from one language to another. Uh, and then once you understand the, the core meaning, so we're really trying to focus on like, like go, and then understanding what under means. And so as you understand these and you start connecting them, it becomes a lot easier to use the figurative, more advanced ways of expressing them. So go under, we say like the boat is going under or the company is going under. 
all right? So go under by itself doesn't change, uh, but the point is the understanding, after you think like, okay, this thing is kind of going down, it's a bad meaning, uh, children understand that, and then so when they hear the company is going under, they think, ah, I can use the expression in this way too. So phrasal verbs are very, very simple if you learn them in this way. This is what we do in the Visual Guide to Phrasal Verbs, uh, which again is included in Fluent for Life. Um, but it's, it's a very simple process of trying to help you understand it like a native by thinking about situations rather than thinking about uh, like translating in the, the English as a second language approach. Hopefully that makes sense. All right. Uh, okay. Hello there. Listening 9 to 10 a day. Make me more confident in short time. Thanks, Noanne. Yeah, glad to hear it. All right. Uh, let's see. Joanna with some, looks like clapping hands. I can't tell if that's clapping hands or washing hands. I can't see what the, <laughs> I guess it is clapping. I listen to the content uh, for natives a lot. Yes, uh, Elder, that's the, that's the key. So Macon, hi Drew, big fan of yours from Brazil, talking about pronunciation and how to clearly understand the difference between can and can't in spoken language. Uh, part of this is uh, just the context. So it's, it can be different, it can be difficult to understand this. We'll give an example here. And it becomes easier to understand uh, differences in things like this uh, the more examples you get. So if you can hear lots of different examples of natives talking about this in different situations, uh, then you will hear. Uh, it, will, it will be easier for you to hear these things. So I can uh, and I can't. So first, when you're learning these things, and this is the same way I would teach my own children, uh, I hear, I, I make sure it's very clear for them what they're listening to. So I want them to understand the word, even if they can't read it, so they can both read these words now. Uh, but uh, when they were just learning can and can't, that's a very basic thing that children learn from a very young age. Um, and I want, to, I want to like practice that with them. Can you do this? Or I can't do that. So I can. Uh, like, I can uh, throw a marker up in the air and catch it. I can do that. Uh, but can I throw two markers up? Well, actually, I can do that. I can do that, too. But as you're listening to more examples, once natives get an understanding of what the word is, then natives start speaking a little bit faster and start blending their sounds together. So listen carefully as I'm pronouncing it. Like again, the, the textbook way is usually what students get. They only get the textbook version of I can or I can't or even I will hear a, I cannot. A cannot is, is really uncommon in spoken English because people are usually just speaking faster. Cannot uh, is, is usually heard when people are uh, you like you really you really want to to say like it's absolutely impossible to do something like I cannot I cannot uh, leave my office and do something like I cannot so can't is a little bit more casual and cannot is like oh, I'm re like I'm really very serious about something and again we're trying to connect the situation with the vocabulary so in the situation of just can you come to my party tomorrow I'm sorry I can't I can't come to the party. Uh, but like, can you, uh, can you shoot a missile at that country? It's like, no, I cannot. I cannot do that. So you will hear this in movies when people are really trying to be very serious. I cannot. We cannot allow them to do that. Okay. So they're being more serious and you can pay attention for the situation and notice how people are expressing this. So for listening, for hearing these things, again, we begin, even, even like native children are, are getting the same kind of uh, basic textbook examples of things. So I can, I can't, I cannot. But what difference, like the difference is like natives begin learning more like as, a, as a English as a first language approach. Uh, they're hearing it more like I can, can becomes kin. I can, I can, I can, I can, I can, I can. Instead of I can, they're saying I can, I can, I can, I can, I can, I can. So kin, I can go, I can go tomorrow, I can go tomorrow, I can go tomorrow. And you will hear it even faster than that. I can, I can, I can, I can. 
It's almost like I, 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 I can, I can do that. I can do that. So you will, you will usually hear the, the kind of K sound in there. Yeah, I can do that. Can you help me tomorrow? Yeah, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. I can, I can, I can do that. So remember, children are learning, even before they can read the word, they are learning the faster way of pronouncing this. I can do that. I can do that. I can go. I can go. I can go. Now, the difficulty for language learners is usually like, uh, again, hearing can versus can't. So if they hear someone like, yeah, I can't do that. I can't do that. So listen to this pronunciation a little bit faster. I can, I can't, all right? So which one am I saying? I can do that, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that. Which one am I saying? I can do that, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that. I'm saying I can. I can do that. I can do that. And you also maybe notice my facial expression. I look a little bit more positive. Maybe I'm shaking my head like, yeah, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. But if I say, I can't, I can't do that. 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 So I'm more, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't do that. So if it's casual, like going to a party or accepting an invitation or something and it doesn't matter like uh, can you can you get milk after work uh, no I can't do that I can't do that or yeah I can do that I can do that and it's most difficult when you can only hear the example okay so when you you're listening to something like did he say can or can't you can always ask the person like wait did you say can or can't <laughs> But typically, if you're listening for the stress here, I can, I can do that. And there's a, there's a slight stress like difference between these. So I can do that. I can. And this is like, I can't. I can't. We're really, really trying to, to emphasize that. Yeah, I can't do that. So we sometimes you may hear like, I can't. I can't do that. I can't do that. It's more like, like a child would say like, oh, I can't. I can't do that when they're saying... Like, it's not possible for me to do something, even though someone else maybe can do that. So maybe my friend can ride a bike, but I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't do that. But if I'm, if I'm addressing, like, uh, a request for someone, it's usually like, uh, like, I can't. I can't do that. I can't. I can't do that. I can't do that. No, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't do that. All right? I don't want to spend too much time on this, uh, but the, the main idea to develop a better sense of this is to spend more time listening to natives. You spend more time listening to natives. You spend less time watching English language videos that are going to help you, like, like the, the language teacher, even me, like it's, it's, a, it's a useful thing to try to understand things, but you really will improve and get to that fluent level the more time you spend learning like a native. So that's why in Fluent for Life, we take you through these different steps. So the point is to help you, to give you some simple explanations of things, but also give you lots of examples of how natives are communicating. It's pretty simple. All right, let's see. We had a bunch of, let's see, okay. All right, so Adrian, again, I hear some Americans skipping the T at the end, uh, but an interviewer told me I was wrong by not pronouncing the last T of that. I'm confused about that. Yeah, again, it's, it's situational. So natives will say both like, I can, and I, I can't, I can't, I can't. So listen, the, I'm not pronouncing the T really clearly because natives don't do that. They're not, if, if the meaning is understood, then people will try to be as quick as possible. So I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. The space is in there for the T, but the T isn't spoken. I can't, I can't. Same thing with like, so do and don't. Now do and don't is easier for natives or for non-natives to understand because the sound is different. So this is a ooh and this is an o oh sound. So do and don't. Do and don't. But you notice, I'm not saying the T. Do, don't. Do, don't. Do, don't. 
So it's, it's like I'm making space for that. I leave a little bit of space there, but I'm not, I'm not trying to say it clearly. The only time I would pronounce this really well uh, or really clearly is again, it depends on the situation. If I'm really uh, angry at my child for doing something, I would say, don't do that. Don't do that. So you hear it here, here I'm, 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 exp I'm like really expressing myself clearly. Uh, so if I say don't, don't do that. And in that case, in this situation, again, like the, the situation is the most important thing. The situation is more important than the vocabulary because the situation tells you how exactly to say something. So if I'm just saying like, oh, I, yeah, I don't do that. I don't do that. I don't do that. So in that, in that case, I don't do that. So if someone asks me, hey, do you prepare people for English tests? I would say, no, uh, I don't do that. 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 You hear the difference? I'm being more casual I don't do that. I don't do that. I don't do that. So do you wear, I don't know, like, uh, do I wear, a, like, I, I don't know. So I'm trying to think of a good example, but, but basically like the, like the one I just gave, if I'm being casual and I know the other person can understand what I'm saying, no, I don't do that. So do I, do I sell fruit for a living? No, I don't do that. I don't, I don't sell fruit. <laughs> That's not what I do. But if I want to be very clear, like I'm, if I'm angry or I'm just trying to be really, really understood, it's a slightly different situation. So even though the vocabulary is the same, the situation means that you're going to say it in a slightly different way. And so I would say, no, like, don't do that. You notice with both of these T's, they come back. Don't do that. Don't do that. You can hear the, like the expression. You can see my face. Maybe I'm looking a bit angrier. Don't do that. And I really want to make sure people understand what I'm saying. And I'm just making it clear. But I'm saying the exact same words. So remember, the English as a second language approach, you're beginning with vocabulary. But the English as a first language's approach is we're beginning with the situation. And so the situation is like, okay, if you're angry and you're saying like not to do something, then like, don't do that. You're really making it very clear. But if you're just casually speaking, I don't do that. I don't do that. So you will hear lots of examples of this in, you know, you pay attention to natives, you will watch what they do. And that's how you learn these different expressions. Uh, right. Uh, let's see. All right, Hater, again, uh, most of the time when learning vocabulary, it's hard for him without <coughs> uh, using my language. I use pictures sometimes. Uh, also, it is difficult to interpret vocabulary that has meanings that is not uh, an object. Yes. And so we, of course, had trouble doing that when we were building Frederick. So how do we make like a word like like a capture. So this is a, maybe a little bit easier to understand, but so we would have like an, an image. So the word is capture or captive, I should say. So this is one of, one of the words in the app, captive, captive. And so we have like just a, you know, like a, a whale, you know, in a, in a bowl or something like that. So it's supposed to be like a, like a fish or something in a bowl. And this one is just a fish out. I cannot draw. <laughs> and this is just a fish over here. So we're contrasting these, and this is the thing we're looking at. So captive would mean, ah, okay, we're uh, understanding something is like held in some way. It's captive. So rather than being free, it's captive over here. And then we also give a bunch of different examples. We give at least four, uh, four examples for every word or phrase that we're teaching. Phrase. Uh, we want to really show people how to do this with, uh, with visual examples so they can do that uh, without using their native language. Uh, the next thing to, to note about this uh, is that it's, it's more difficult, um, 
again, when you're trying to think about the word like through your native language, rather than try to think about a situation where you would hear something. So again, focus on the situation first and then listen to what natives are saying for that particular uh, pronunciation. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, let's see. Like guys, underwear 51, thank you very much. Uh, I find difficulty to finish the sentence with correct grammar when I talk to natives. Any suggestion? Uh, yes, so again, everything comes from paying attention to how natives are speaking. And so if you don't feel comfortable or you don't feel confident about finishing sentences or you're unable to do that, it just means you haven't had enough practice with that. So if you give me a specific, uh, like a specific example of a sentence, then I can help you practice that here. But the important thing is not that you try to like repeat that, it's that you hear it again and again, and then you're like, ah, oh, okay, now I feel very confident that I understand what I'm saying. So understanding is really the most important part of speaking. And as I mentioned earlier in the video, when talking about Krashen, he discovered the same thing. So this is like the big shock about language learning is that you don't get fluent by repeating phrases again and again. You get fluent by really understanding something and then they start naturally coming out. Of course, you might make a mistake you know, here or there, but it's uh, much better to really understand something and then only there's maybe like slight fine tuning in pronunciation or something like that when you actually speak. So the more examples you get, the easier it becomes. Uh, let's see, Panny Funny, I already understood interpret from Japanese to English, but I'm still struggling how to make sentences in English brain. Are you Japanese? I don't know, I can't tell from the picture if you're Japanese or not. Uh, but the point is like if you're, if you're learning from Japanese into English or you're learning from German into English or whatever the language is, uh, that you're thinking about it as a student rather than thinking about how you learn your native language. So the easiest way to understand this is remember how are you learning new words in your native language. So a Japanese person who speaks Japanese fluently uh, is going to listen to lots of new words and expressions and they will learn all those things in Japanese. All they have to do is just apply that same thing to learning English words. So instead of thinking about the Japanese first or the German first or whatever the, you know, the French or whatever your language is, uh, you're thinking about the English situation and watching what natives do. So if you get examples of how natives communicate, that's what really it means to learn the same way children learn. So I'm giving, uh, I, I don't usually teach my kids, uh, like I don't teach them English through Japanese or Japanese through English. If I'm trying to teach them a Japanese thing, I will speak in Japanese and teach them that. Uh, so, I, I, so I don't teach them to translate in their head. Uh, and they do a really good job of like speaking in that, in that particular language when they're switching from one to the other. Claudette, again, I love your explanation about phrasal verbs. Thanks a lot. It gave me a big picture. Yes. Bus stop thinking the words, ah, linking, linking the words, it makes sense for fast speaking and understanding. Glad to hear it. Yeah. Uh, so the most important thing is a practice of speaking loudly that, uh, that I come up with the thinking. No, the, the, the most important thing, the thing I am, I am saying is that you don't get fluent by just like repeating loudly or speaking out. Like the thing that you should be doing is getting lots of input. And this is the, this is like the most, this is probably the most, I don't know, the most confusing thing to me as a teacher. When I was learning, I discovered this idea. I felt very excited because I thought, yes, like I don't have to find a speaking practice partner. I just need to get lots of examples. So I can go to a Japanese restaurant and, you know, sit and listen to people's conversations <laughs> If I, if I want to do that, and I'm not saying anything, but I'm learning a lot. I'm like, ah, okay, you can use this expression like that or whatever. And as I hear more examples of that, that's how I feel more confident about using things. And then I finally start speaking. So most of my practice is not speaking. Most of my practice is actually just listening to lots of different examples. And so this is why, uh, like occasionally we will get like, there is a, a certain kind of learner who, who you know, will like uh, want to learn more about what we do or maybe try some of our programs. Uh, and they're, they're still thinking about learning in this way. And so they will begin with uh, like the particular word or phrase they want to use. And they're thinking about translating. And they think that if they know that phrase already, 
they're already like they don't need to review it again. And usually I just say to those learners like, great, if you're already fluent, why are you looking for help? If you're already fluent, why are you looking for help? And so it's like, if, if your way works, then why are you looking for help? Just keep doing what you're doing. But for most people, like their way is not actually working, but it's difficult for them to try doing something new. And this is understandable. It's hard, you know, for ever since people are young, they're told that they need to learn in a certain way, even though it's not working for them. But they are just told, and it's, it's like a, I don't know, it's just like a really weird, uh, thing about about the mind like from the time you were very young if you were told you have to learn this way You have to learn and memorize grammar rules and try to translate learn definitions of words that kind of thing uh, And you have to speak so if you're told all of those things and then uh, like another guy says hey uh, You actually don't have to do those things in order to speak. It's it's hard to accept that I understand uh, but as I say the proof the proof is in the pudding. That's another great expression for you, the proof. The proof is in the pudding. So this is like you think about actual pudding or whatever, like some pudding that you eat. So like the, the good flavor, you can tell if something is good or not by, like, by actually giving it a try. So the proof is in the pudding. Uh, and if, if you were continuing to learn this way and that is not helping you speak, then be open to trying something different, all right? Uh, and this is not like a crazy method that I came up with. It's just applying how you learn your native language. That's it. All right, let's see. Thanks for the tip on phrasal verbs. Glad to hear it. Uh, when I say with, with his, with his, do I need the pronunciation of the TH sound? With his. With his, with his. Like with his example, with his example, we would we would blend blend these parts together. It's like with this, with this. You can pronounce it again if you want to be more clear, just to make sure people understand. You can say with his, but typically we would pronounce this faster with his. So with his experience, with his experience, with his experience, with his experience. So you can say both of those, uh, both of those are fine. It's just uh, natives will, will use both depending on the situation. If you want to be clear, with his experience, he will be good for president. Or with his experience, with his experience, with his experience, with his experience. So the same thing. It just depends on if you want to be more clear or not. Uh, but the point is you should be prepared for, for natives when they actually speak and you will hear these differences in the, in the conversation. So try to listen more uh, for what's the, what's the situation here rather than just what's the vocabulary they're using. All right. Uh, okay. So I don't do that. Is it pronounced like I won't, I won't. It's not really I won't to do that. It's like I, I don't, I don't, I, it's more like I won't. If you want to, if you want to really say it like that, like I don't do that. So some people will say it even faster. I don't do that. 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 Precise, precisely, precisely focused on pronunciation. Can you recommend how to learn English step by step? For example. One nouns and dialogue. This topic. Um, okay. Well, since people are uh, curious how we do this, I'd actually I'd, I'd love to hear. It's it's usually better if you tell me how you think you will learn. So if if you think like okay today we're going to learn some nouns uh, and tomorrow we're going to do some pronunciation or something like that. These are all uh, English as a second language approaches. So what I actually do, uh, the same thing I do with my children is the same thing I do in my programs. And so what I do, we begin with the end when we're learning. Let me see what time it is. Oh, it's already 11. Oh, my goodness. 11.30. We've been doing this 78 minutes. Oh, my goodness. All right. So uh, let's imagine I'm teaching my own children. All right, so you're not worrying about like teaching English or anything as like a, as a different language. I'm just teaching my own kids. Uh, there's a situation, just like this. We got a situation here, uh, and then there is some kind of vocabulary. Uh, so we have situation and vocabulary. 
So uh, maybe I am, uh, I'm excited about something they did. So I, the situation is I am excited and I want to like praise my children. So I would say great, great job. Or I might also hear like nice, nice work. And there are other ways I could ex express this too. But my kids, what they're doing, they're not, there's no Japanese in here. They're learning everything in English. So they understand the situation, like they won a game or they finished their homework or something like that. And I say, okay, here's the vocabulary. Great job. Nice work. And they might not even understand every word that I say, but they understand like the meaning of the whole thing is like, here is a positive thing you say when you praise people. And they hear that, you know, from many different people, many different examples. Uh, and so taking this idea, uh, if, you, if you understand this idea, what I do in Fluent for Life is we begin with a situation and the situation is usually two or three people talking. And then before we get to this, because this is there's a lot of information in a conversation, like a lot of information. So not just the vocabulary people are using, but how they're pronouncing words, uh, how they're feeling, the tone of voice that they have. Uh, and so we want to break this into different pieces. So some of this will be understanding the vocabulary. And, and, and I do this because it's, again, it's overwhelming just to watch a conversation between two people. So unless your English is already at a very high level, uh, it's probably not going to help you very much to do that. In fact, it will make you more frustrated. But if you can learn some of that vocabulary first, here are some key phrases we want to look at. Uh, here are some key like cultural ideas. Uh, and maybe we want to talk about here some like some specific grammar things that we want you to focus on. We're going to really just focus on these pieces first. And so you go through these pieces and after you go through these, you finally go to this and the situation makes a lot more sense. Okay. So this is how you should be learning the language. And in a, in a, in an everyday way, if you're trying to do this by yourself, you're really just looking at situations. So I would go to like the restaurant example. I'm sitting at a restaurant and listening to different people talking or listening to how people order from their waiter. Okay. Or I go to a cafe and I'm listening to how people go to the counter and order food. And I will learn all of those different things. And so I'm not, I'm not just like randomly learning vocabulary. I'm learning it for situations. So in this situation, people are talking about, I don't know, getting married or something. Uh, or people are talking about uh, raising kids. Or they're talking about going to work. Or they're talking about, I don't know, like business meetings or giving presentations or something like that. But I'm paying attention to what they're talking about and I learn like, ah, in this situation people say this. And I'm trying to think more like a native and recognize the patterns that people are using rather than just like trying to learn a bunch of random words and phrases, okay? And so when we do this in Fluent for Life, you begin by focusing on particular uh, topics that you are interested in. And you go very deep into that. That's why we spend so much time uh, looking at all these different pieces and approaching them in, in different ways because the vocabulary is not really the problem for people. It's like how well you know the vocabulary. So most learners, they get stuck because they think they know a lot of vocabulary, but they actually don't. So they think they know something but then they get into a conversation and forget the word, or they can't recall it very quickly when they, when they want to use that thing. So that's where the real problem comes from. So it's not about learning some vocabulary. The step-by-step -step plan is this. So we begin with a, a situation, and rather than you trying to just watch it directly, we want to bring you through a bunch of steps first that make this all easier to understand. And then when you get to the real conversation, it makes a lot more sense. Okay. Now, an interesting thing that uh, sometimes I tell Fluent for Life members to do is start with the conversation. So if you watch the conversation first, you will think, wow, this might be a little bit overwhelming. There are lots of things here. I don't know really what I should be paying attention for. Uh, and then they go through the steps and they watch the conversation again, and it makes a lot more sense. So they really understand things much better. Again, that's the point of having a teacher help you and kind of guide you through what's happening in the conversation. 
So the conversation is a, it's a much bigger thing. That's why we spend a whole month focusing on one thing and people think like, wow, that's so much time to spend on that. It's like, that's how you get fluent. That's what little kids are doing when they're learning their native language. They're learning like a bunch of individual phrases like great job and nice work and then they're starting to put those together in a, in a bigger, longer sentences, okay? So that's how you do it. So step by step, uh, the bigger, bigger picture of what we do is this, but it's, it's just the same thing as looking at any situation and paying attention to what natives do. So if I drop something on my head, I say, ouch. If I pick up something heavy, I say, ah. And kids learn that. In Japanese, like, you, you like stand up and stretch, you say, oh, shh, ah, shh, ah. You actually use different sounds in Japanese. And little kids learn that. It's, like, it's not like the human body naturally makes like, ugh, versus a yosh sound. It's just what kids learn in that situation. For this situation, they learn that, uh, that particular vocabulary. Uh, all right, let's see here. All right, so I found this sentence really hard to say smoothly. He is gesturing with his hand as he talks. Do you mean he is gesturing, gesturing with his hand as he talks? Yeah, so that one, like, he is gesturing... So he is gesturing. I would look at the specific part of that phrase or that sentence that's giving you trouble. So maybe if it's the word gesturing, usually people will say I have like a problem with this, but the problem is actually much smaller than that. So if you, if you would begin, uh, like one of the things we do in Fluent for Life is if we take a, let me, I give a simpler expression like this. Uh, I won't use the exact thing you gave, but you will understand the exercise from this. So like, I spent time at the gym. Now, I really want to make sure I understand the whole sentence, but if I'm trying to like practice saying it just to get in the habit of that, uh, I would actually begin with kind of the smaller piece of it here at the end, like the gym, the gym the gym. I really wanted to get comfortable, make sure I understand what this means, like the gym. Yeah, I'm talking about that, you know, physical place uh, where I, you know, where I exercise or something, the gym. And now I'm going to make this bigger. So notice we're starting with the end of the sentence and working backwards. Uh, so at the gym, at the gym, at the gym, at the gym. And we hear, ah, look at that. So we've got at the gym. So we've got we've got the same kind of T, and this is a like this is the the TH digraph sound, but we're gonna eliminate that one and get at the gym, at the gym, at the gym, at the gym. And again, we're going to extend it even more. Time at the gym. Time at the gym. So tie at the gym. Time at the gym. Time at the gym. So if you want to get better at saying it, it's a little bit easier, like, you, I mean, you could start from, from this way, but I, I like to start from the end just because uh, it's easier to understand usually like the, the way English sentences are structured, uh, where we're just focusing on like a core idea that like just could be a phrase by itself. So you could say like, I spent time, but like, that's a little harder to understand without like spending time doing what? Like, you, like usually there's like some, you're spending time doing something. But just the gym is an idea by itself that's easier to understand. All right, so when you have a, a particular sentence that you're trying to say, I would break it into these pieces like that, and then you can see exactly uh, where you're struggling to pronounce something. But if you have native examples of that, you can actually hear how natives are saying it. So this is what we do in Fluent for Life and why we make it easier for people, uh, because we're giving you lots of native examples. So I spent time at the gym, same thing here. Spent time at the gym, and then who spends time at the gym? I spent time at the gym. Okay, so if you ever have any kind of sentence like that, I would break it down in these pieces uh, and really make sure, number one, that you understand that, and number two, that you can explain that uh, and, and, and like, and you understand how the, the pronunciation works as well. All right, uh, so Adrian again, but why the interviewers at companies force people to pronounce the T, for example, when the Americans don't? And I'm just giving you one example among others. Uh, Adrian, I think in that example, it would usually be because 
Um, like if you're in a, in a professional situation or in a customer service situation, you would usually try to speak a bit more clearly, especially if you're on the phone and it's hard to, maybe people can't distinguish like, uh, like we can do that or we can't do that. So if that's more difficult to understand, that's why people would encourage you to pronounce it more. So if I'm like, uh, like in regular everyday Japanese society, I don't, I don't speak uh, the way I would speak in a meeting or something. So if I'm if I'm meeting like the president of a company, I'm going to talk with him or her in a different way than I would like casually speaking. So I just you know sometimes you have to uh, think about it in that way uh, for for particular situations. Again, it depends on what the situation is. All right, Tark says, uh, sir, I want to advance to speaking level. I want to be able to do press conference at the highest level, how would I stumble to this level? Uh, you would watch a lot of people giving press conferences and pay attention to how they speak. I would start there. All right, hi there, it's, uh, again, can I, after guessing the sentence or vocabulary, go and see its translation into my language so that I know whether I'm a right or not? Uh, if I guess wrong, what should I do? Yes, uh, ideally, in a, in a perfect world, you should hopefully be able to understand something in English, uh, and you can use an English to English dictionary, uh, but if you need to get a translation, that's not, it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. I put a capital there. It's not the end of the world, so that means it's not the worst thing if you have to look up a translation in your native language. <laughs> it's not the end of the world if you need to look up a translation. It's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. So it's okay if you need to look up a translation, that's fine. Uh, Claude it again. Now the preposition is another headache uh, when to use on to into again. Yes, Claude, and that's why like you should get, get the phrasal verb program if you don't have that already. It will take you through those. You learn the core verbs and you learn how phrasal verbs uh, work with their prepositions as well. All right. Uh, welcome to real life. Uh, thank you. See you next time. Hopefully. Okay. Next. Thank you for your knowledge and time. I appreciate it. Have a good night. You're welcome. I really appreciate your time for explaining everything. Thank you so much for help here in uh, Mexico. It is 8.30 p.m. Good night. Enjoy your week ahead. See you next week. Steve says, thanks. So true. How and when to use the vocabulary and phrases in different situations. Yes. I remember the school years that we had the reading lessons and we learned in that way. Yeah. So you can spend a lot of time and learn a lot that way. I learn a lot of Japanese just from reading. And then I just use the speech. Uh, let's see. I've been getting a lot, lots of input. Started using the app. My comprehension is even better. I'm still having trouble with my pronunciation. Still haven't passed level four yet. <laughs> Are you talking about Frederick? Uh, should I keep going or... Maybe that was the end of that. If you're talking about Frederick, yeah, so spend, spend time... Uh, on those first few levels, go over all of the uh, all of the pronunciation there. Uh, but a lot of that pronunciation will continue, like the short vowel sounds will continue into higher levels. So if you if you start on level one, it's just the alphabet. Level two and level three are just uh, two and three letter words that have the short vowel sounds like a, e, i, a, a. Uh, and even as you go into the higher levels, you will you will hear those uh, same sounds as well. So there's lots of review as you go through it, even if you uh, get into higher levels. Adrian, got it. Thanks. Uh, backward learning process for learning pronunciation. More proper way. I would love to learn a real casual English language. Do you have a course like that? Yeah, that's exactly what Fluent for Life is. I'll write the, let's see if that's Fluent. Fluent for Life. So this is what uh, the course that it, ta it basically teaches you how to have conversations like a native English speaker. That's the whole point of the program. Uh, I originally called this Master English Conversation, uh, and this is back when I started doing monthly lesson sets. So I had people follow me every month, and we would go through new things, but then after we had so many of them, I wanted to give people the option uh, to choose what they learn with. So maybe some people just want to focus on more, you know, things that you would find in British or British English or New Zealand English or things that you would hear uh, in a, like a business meeting or something like that. So when you get in Fluent for Life, 
it basically teaches you how to communicate well in business or conversational situations, uh, but the same way a native would. Uh, so we're going to try to take you, uh, instead of learning through your native language, we're going to help you learn it all in English. And that's how you become a good speaker. All right, did I get back to everything? Please make shorts about pronunciation. Yeah, if you want, again, pronunciation, like the shortest thing we have is Frederick. Just get that. <laughs> So if you, if you click on the link in the description below this video, you can get Frederick, you can also get Fluent for Life. Uh, but Frederick explains, like, it takes you through all the pronunciation and shows you how to learn these things and blend them together. So it's a very simple program, uh, and it will help you communicate and understand natives a lot more easily. All right, I think that should be it. It looks like we covered everybody. Hopefully that makes sense. Again, the, the goal of this video is to help people uh, instead of only using textbook English, uh, and again, there's nothing wrong with that. The point is that uh, we just we want you to have a wider vocabulary than just only using a few uh, words, because especially even if you don't use them, you will hear natives using these words and uh, words and phrases. All right, did we get anything else here? How should I learn idioms that can last forever in my brain? Uh, so go back, maybe you just joined us now, but go back, uh, Aisha, and, and review what I talked about for learning phrasal verbs. It works exactly the same way. So if you're, like a lot of these recent videos I have made on YouTube are me talking about like how people should be learning, but all the stuff in Fluent for Life is actually like teaching you stuff in the language. <laughs> So I spent a lot more time uh, doing that. Uh, I do some, some things are kind of helping you uh, learn some tips or strategies in there as well. But most of it is just like giving you lots of vocabulary and following that same thing I covered earlier in this video. All right. Uh, I live in the U.S. I'm a surgical assistant for cardiovascular in the U.S. I need for casual English. Yeah. So often uh, we do have people like... A, a lot, you know, I get like thousands of messages from people, thousands of emails, and I have uh, like a Word document. I call it the pain doc. Uh, this is all the complaints that people have about learning. Um, and an interesting thing that we get from professionals specifically is that they often know, like you might know the, the words or phrases for cardiovascular, you know, like that particular vocabulary. Maybe you learn that in school and you just remember that. But then you have trouble talking about like a movie that you saw on the weekend. So most people in, in professional situations have that. Uh, and in most like business English classes, they kind of forget that that human component of or the human part of everyday communication. So even in a business situation, you're still talking with people in like a, a casual way. So you might have, you know, particular business vocabulary that you're learning, but in Fluent for Life, we teach that business vocabulary, but we also teach you how to just have regular conversations with people. <laughs> so it's a pretty simple thing, uh, but it's, it's uh, much easier than most people think if you do it like a native. All right. Uh, hi from Brazil. How do I know if I'm really ready to use my English in a company? Uh, how do you know if you're ready to use English, use my English in the company? If you mean like you speaking, it's the same way you feel about any, any speaking in any situation. Really the difference, the important thing is that you're not thinking about like your English, you're really thinking about this vocabulary or this grammar point. So you might feel comfortable about some things but not others and that's normal. Uh, you will you will know some things much better than others, and then you will use those things more often in conversations. So the important thing is, if there's something you feel uncomfortable about, you should spend more time getting input for that. So listening to more examples, and again, this is the kind of thing we do in Fluent for Life. It's not, if you already know vocabulary, you will probably see some of that same vocabulary again, but do you really know it well enough to use it? That's the important thing. So those are the people we help. 
So don't worry about like English in general, focus on the, like the specific issues that you might have, whatever those are. Uh, yes, if you do not use it, you lose it, that's true. Uh, but I learned a new word on day one and forgot it on day four. As you said, we should focus on input first. Yeah. And so input not only means like, and this is, as I mentioned, uh, Stephen Krashen earlier in the video. Uh, so he is a linguist focusing on helping teachers become better teachers. But me, I'm actually making lessons for students. So like the, we have the same idea about how people should be learning, but the focus is different. Um, and so that's, you know, we have kind of different ideas about how uh, people should be actually improving uh, with the specific training. So for me, like what you will do in Fluent for Life with, with a, like as just like an example of one phrase. So you might hear something like, uh, it's not the end of the world. Um, but you will, you will like learn that in one lesson and then you might try to write that down the next day. Then you will hear it in a different lesson. Maybe a different native speaker uses that same expression. Uh, then you will hear it in a conversation. You will hear it again as like people asking you questions about it. All right, so you're getting all these different examples. You don't learn a phrase and become fluent in it by hearing it one time, especially not like a longer phrase like that. You might hear a word like cat and think, okay, I understand what that means without reviewing it very much. That's fine. You don't have to review something a lot in order to understand it. But typically, uh, people don't review things enough, and that's why they don't speak. So the people that, you know, like it's like anything in your, you know, in your life. If you're a professional at doing something, you might know something, but you like the real masters at that profession are the people who know it really, really well. It's, it's that simple. So if you learn a simple phrase uh, and then you forget it a few days later, then you don't really know that phrase. It's just probably in your passive vocabulary. All right. Let's see here. Arnold says, uh, Sir, my English improved tremendously by watching your videos for a long time. I can't thank you enough. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Glad to hear uh, is, uh hi, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much. In all languages, yes. Uh, if I learn 10 new words, can I just remember, uh, if I learn 10 words, new words, uh, just can remember only one word a day. Yeah, again, like, you're not, you, this isn't like learning, if, if, you, if you spend time, like, you learn, like, imagine each one of these is a new word or phrase. So this is one day here, uh, we're going to give you like five new words or phrases, and then we never cover those again. You didn't learn anything. That was a horrible lesson, uh, unless it was like so perfect that you remember everything. And that's, it's probably unlikely. So even my lessons, like I can think I'm an amazing teacher, but I know like the human mind is like, I could be teaching something. The lesson could be really great. You're watching a video, but uh, in the back of your mind, you're thinking about what are you doing for dinner? <laughs> or you're thinking about laundry, or you're thinking about, I don't know, whatever you're thinking about. But you're not 100% focused all the time on everything. Nobody is. And so that's why it's important to review. So even, even if you only watch the same video again, which most people do not want to do, uh, you will actually remember a lot more and you will learn a lot more, all right? But the, the important thing, the, the difference between what I do and the, the English as a second language approach is that like, I don't want you to just repeat the exact same thing. Uh, I want to have you listen to different people I want you to hear things in different situations. I want you to hear different ways of express, uh, different ways of expressing things, and that's how you get fluent. Okay. All right. I'm gonna have to shut this down because uh, I'm basically out of time. We've been a hundred minutes. Oh my goodness, a hundred minutes of talking about this stuff. Oh my goodness. So yes, it's uh, be careful. It's not just repeating stuff. You want to repeat it in different ways. This is what I call naturally varied review. I've had some native speakers. Sometimes they also lack grammar. Why? Uh, I don't know. I'd have to hear the example of that. But yes, not everyone speaks correct English, <laughs> just like in any language. You're going to have some people who speak better than others, some people who make mistakes, and some people who also use incorrect English that's really... Eh, I, like we could call it incorrect English, but for most people, it's just like, like there's, there's two cars over there. You should say there are two cars over there, not there's two cars over there. But many people will say that because it's just faster and easier to say. So it's incorrect grammar, but most people use that.
real quick. <laughs> How would you prepare yourself if you just had a week to study? Uh, it'd be like a week to a week to study for a test or something like that. I would just I don't know sit down and and try to memorize everything I needed just for the test. If that if that's all you had to do, I don't know. I can't think of like a better way to do that. Like if you if you're trying to learn for a test or you have to pass a particular class, just focus on that teacher's information, whatever, because it's different from a real life conversation, which is dynamic. So if you just have something like, you know, go ahead and repeat those things or, or do whatever. It's not the way I teach to help people learn for real conversations. But if you have a like a deadline and you have to I don't know do whatever for that particular situation, I would focus on that. All right. It is not that they are a lack of grammar. Yes, yeah, so I mean, most people would, I mean, they can understand it, but maybe they just don't speak correctly. It happens. Anyway, uh, if this has been an uh, interview, ah, ah, okay. Uh, yeah, I would watch other people, other people doing like real interviews. I would talk with, and this is a whole separate, separate thing about um, like preparing to get a job or something like that. Like even more important than the interview is you're looking for a way to kind of connect with the people uh, who would give you a job. So I would find out more about the company, figure out how I can help the company, and I would talk about that in the interview. So they might even give me a question or something. I would say, that's a good question. Uh, and like here, and maybe answer that, but I would have some things prepared about like how I can actually help the company. Like I noticed the company does a good job of this, but like maybe they're not so good at doing this other thing over here and here's how I can help. So thinking about how you can help the company and tell that to the, the person you're getting uh, interviewed by, that would be better for you, I guess. But again, I, I would need more information about that. Uh, if I want to attend your class, what should I do? Click on the link in the description below this video. You can learn more about Fluent for Life. And again, if your goal is to, uh, you know, be good at communicating not only in professional life, but also in everyday situations, we'll show you how to do it. It's really that simple. If you have questions about the program after you learn more about it, you can send us a mail at info at englishanyone.com. Uh, but it's really that simple. All right, Mr. Shaw will be the last question here. Uh, in a non-native country, people don't have the specific atmosphere or situations to learn English. What should they do? That's what Fluent for Life is for. Fluent for Life is basically like simulating a native environment, uh, but in a, in a way that you can understand. You don't need to be in an English-speaking country to get, just like now, like I'm in Japan, I'm not in the United States, and I'm not in the same room as anyone, but you're still learning from me. So it's the same idea. If I can help you get uh, really good input and help you understand English like a native, then you will use English like a native. It's that simple. Yeah. So yes, I uh, look forward to welcoming you. Feel free to send us a mail if you have any questions, uh, but that's how you do it. A teacher gave an idioms workbook. Will this work? Uh, I don't know. I would, I would, I would, I would, I'd have to see the workbook, I guess. Uh, but in general, you should understand it like a native, like the things that I talk about. Go back and watch this video uh, where I'm talking about uh, learning phrasal verbs. So the same kinds of things where you're understanding it visually if you can. You're understanding the core meaning or the basic meaning of something in the simplest way. Uh, and then looking at maybe how an idiom might come from that. So most people are probably not doing that. Most things, if it's a textbook, it is probably just giving you, um, I don't know, like a definition of something through a translation probably, which is not going to help you use it. Don't learn a bunch of idioms if you're not going to be able to use them. It doesn't make sense to spend time learning vocabulary if you can't actually use it. Guys, get the app. You'll have a private teacher who never gets tired. Yes. <laughs> Yes, he's talking about uh, Frederick. Yes, so that's what Frederick is. Frederick is me. It's like having me there uh, always like, uh, you know, to help you with your pronunciation and listening whenever you like, but you get to listen to my voice. Uh, it is more about connection than perfection. That's true. I will send you an email. Yes. All right, that's it. I'm going to have to run, but thank you all for joining us. How do I how to recognize the update of the contents on your website? How can I recognize the update of the contents on your website? I don't know what you mean by that, but if you have questions, let us know. Send us an email. Uh, usually we update people about things uh, just via email, but if you have questions about anything, let us know at info at englishanyone.com. Have a fantastic day. Remember, how you learn is how you speak. If you want to learn like a native so you speak like a native, then this is how you do it. Learn English as a first language rather than as a uh, second language. By a handsome man. Okay. <laughs> you guys are too kind. Bye-bye.